Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. Ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel? We invite you to get your Bible and join us if you care to today. We're going to pick it up today with Psalm 65, verse 1. And as we ended that Psalm 64, uh, we learned that, you know, redemption for the righteous is God's judgment. Uh, to see uh, the wicked get their just rewards, their just dessert, if you will, uh, is, is a, a, re a form of redemption. And you know, uh, as, it, as we read in Psalm 37, that uh, the righteous, uh, God's elect in particular, will be allowed to be present when the wicked go into the lake of fire. They'll see it. And I know a lot of Christians would say, well, boy, I don't think I want to see that. Let me be on the front row. I, I, I'll pay to be on the front row. But in fact, is you can't pay. Uh, those seats aren't for sale, but you can earn one. But, you know, when Satan goes into that lake of fire, I'd like to be there to see that because I've seen what that rascal has done to my brothers and sisters in Christ. And to see him get his just reward, we certainly don't want him in the eternity, I, I promise you. And uh, to see him get what's coming to him, yeah, I'd like to be there and see that. Psalm 65, we kind of went over the uh, superscription, the title, if you will, but once again, a psalm, mizmor in the Hebrew, or meditation, and song, shir, S-H-I-R, transliterated into English, which simply means to be sung of David. <clears throat> Our subject, Israel's redemption, and we're going to see that we've been talking about the redemption of the people in Israel. Now we're going to switch gears and talk about the redemption of Zion and, and nature uh, around Zion, if you will. Psalm 65, let's ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua Jesus' precious name, Father. We ask you to open eyes, open ears this day. Let's pick it up, Psalm 65, verse 1. <clears throat> Praise waiteth for thee, O God, in Zion, and unto thee shall the vow be performed. And the vow will be paid, in other words. Now, did you catch anything? How many of you caught something very unusual in that first verse? Sion. If you go to the New Testament, uh, in the Greek language, in other words, uh, you'll find Zion with an S there. In the Old Testament, Zion was normally with a Z. And it's thought that this probably crept into the King James Version Bible uh, by the translators using the uh, Septuagint and the Vulgate, which are uh, Greek versions of the Old Testament. And they just flat missed uh, the S, which actually in the Old Testament should be Z. But again, we see uh, the switching gears from uh, the redemption of the people to the redemption of Zion. Now this waiteth, uh, interesting, it means is, is silent. And I like to think of it as silent resignation. Uh, and you could think of that as a, a complete, entire resignation to God, which gives up its cause to God and allows Him to act on its behalf without any impatient interference or meddling. And, you know, God's elect, we're, we're, patience is not one of our long suits. Uh, we're notoriously uh, anxious for, we're ready for things to happen. But as I said, we were answering questions in our last lesson that God's, the, you know, we're the servants. God's the quarterback. He's the one who calls the plays. He's the one who decides when what happens, and rightfully so. I wouldn't want it any other way. So, so, but be careful as you are serving God 
that you don't uh, cause any interference or, or impatient meddling. Uh, he has a plan, it's a perfect plan, and you may have a part in accomplishing that plan, but uh, as far as the when and where and, and so forth, uh, let him be the quarterback. He, he's a real good play caller. Verse 2, O thou that hearest prayer, unto thee shall all flesh come, individually and collectively. We all need our Heavenly Father. And note that thou that hearest prayer and those that love and serve him, I'll add, and answerest prayer. Verse 3, Iniquities prevail against me. As for our transgressions, thou shalt purge them away. Iniquities you can think of as sins. And no matter how hard we try, we all sin. And if you say otherwise, as it reads in the, the first epistle uh, of, of James, you're, you're, you're deceiving yourself if you say you're not uh, a sinner. And we all need to purge away those sins from time to time. And, and that means, of course, to uh, be forgiven of those sins. And then we have a clean slate uh, then we're good to go ahead upon repentance and obtaining that forgiveness. We're, we've got a clean start. Uh, if you are one that walks around with a, a heavy load, a heavy burden of sins on your head, on your shoulders, it's awful easy to, to love your Father, serve Him, repent with a true repentant heart, and get rid of those sins. Verse 4. Blessed, or happy you could translate, is the man whom thou choosest. What is that? You mean God chooses some of us? And causes to approach unto thee. That doesn't sound like free will to me. That sounds more like election. That he may dwell in thy courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house even of thy holy temple. Not all will enjoy the abundant blessings of residing with him. And it's written in Ezekiel chapter 44. Uh, there are only a, a select group who will be allowed to reside with Christ in the millennial temple. In other words, in the holy temple. That's a future temple, the millennial temple. And those who are going to be allowed to minister and reside with him in the temple, of course, are called the Zadok in Ezekiel 44, a uh, Hebrew word that means the upright. And, of course, the upright are those who didn't worship the Antichrist. Uh, they serve God in a very special way in the first earth age. They're not a special group of people. Uh, he doesn't show, Father doesn't show favoritism or partiality to anyone, but if you've earned it, you get what you deserve. And God's elect earned it in the first earth age. They will uh, serve him and witness against the Antichrist in this earth age, the second earth age, and they will be with Christ in the millennial temple and, and share in the blessings of that, besides the fact of partaking in the first resurrection and then the second death, the death of the soul, has no power over them. Verse 5, by terrible things in righteousness wilt thou answer us or defend us, O God our salvation, who art the confidence or the refuge of all the ends of the earth and of them that are afar off upon the sea, in other words, throughout uh, the entire world. This is a terrible translation. Uh, this word terrible uh, is, should have been translated awesome or, or to be revered, you could even think of. The actual word is yare in the Hebrew language, and it can mean feared, uh, but of course the only ones that should fear God are his enemies. Verse 6 which, or who, by his strength setteth fast the mountains, or the nations, mountains always symbolic of nations, being girded with power. Everything 
in the natural world and the men who inhabit it uh, will yield to our Heavenly Father's power. <clears throat> the setteth fast, it means to set up. And indeed, our Heavenly Father sets up the mountains and the nations of the world. He, he's in control, and there is no power uh, in government power, for example, on earth. It's written in the book of Romans that is not ordained of God. Verse 7, which stilleth the noise of the seas, the noise of their waves and the tumult of the people. You could think of the noise, the seas here as uh, the worldly powers. Uh, the waters are the seas also in the book of Revelation chapter 17 verse 15 are symbolic of what? They're symbolic of the peoples. So uh, God stills the, the worldly powers and uh, I couldn't help but think about when Christ was crossing over the sea in the New Testament and he was asleep in, in the rear of the boat and a storm came up, a terrible storm. And the disciples all ran to him and said, Master, we perish and you don't even care. And, and Christ went on to say, you know, oh, you know why are you fearful? Why, and uh, you of little faith. And then he rebuked the storm and the storm, a, a tremendous calm, uh, came over the storm. Uh, and God has that power. Uh, if people are rowdy and unruly or noisy, uh, the nations of the world, He has the power to shut them up, uh, to, to cause them for a great calm uh, to come over them. Verse 8, They also that dwell in the uttermost parts are afraid at thy tokens. These tokens are uh, miracles, if you will, or signs. Thou makest the outgoings of the morning and the evening to rejoice. This is a, a figure of speech that means from where the sun comes up in the east to where it goes down in the west, meaning the entire earth is included uh, in this particular uh, scripture. When he overthrows the Antichrist, too, the world will reverence him. In fact, and every knee will bow, every tongue will confess when he returns as King of Kings and Lord of Lords at the seventh trump. Verse 9, Thou visitest the earth and waterest it. He causes the rain to come down. Thou greatly enrichest it with the river of God which is full of water. Thou preparest them corn when thou hast so provided for it. And his blessings provide abundantly for us. And you, know, this, uh, you should immediately think of Deuteronomy chapter 11 when you think of rains from God. And what was happening there, God was preparing Moses and the Israelites to move into a land where they would not cultivate the land with their foot, meaning that they would not irrigate the land from the Nile River, but rather they would be dependent on God to, to water the soil. And, and God is telling Moses there, if you and the people of Israel will follow my instructions and, and you do things my way, that I will cause the rains to come, and you won't want for anything. I'll bring the, the former rain, which is the early rains that uh, cause the seed to germinate after it's planted in the ground and spring forth a plant. And then later, as the plant grows and matures, God says, I'll promise you I'll give you the latter rain, which will allow the plant to mature and bring forth fruit, and then you can harvest it. And on a physical sense, you'll have uh, sufficient bread uh, for you and your children to eat. You can take that to a spiritual level as well. Uh, when you plant a seed of God's truth uh, with someone, uh, that's your, you've done your part. Then it's up to God to provide that former rain which 
causes the seed to germinate and sprout into a plant. And then as the person matures and, and learns that God's will is more important than their own will, then they submit and he gives them that, that, that latter reign which allows them to go ahead and mature as a Christian. So the former and latter reign is very important, but again, the, the key is you do things God's way, he will send those reigns. If you don't do things his way, guess what? The reigns don't come. Verse 10. Thou waterest the ridges thereof abundantly. In other words, the, the hillsides and, and mountain ridges. He, the rain also falls there, not just in, in land that man cultivates. Thou settest the furrows, settlest, I should say, the furrows thereof. Thou makest it soft with showers. Thou blessest the springing thereof, the sprout thereof, better translated. Now this, thou settlest the furrows. What this means is that, in many of you with reference Bibles, you have a note on that that could be translated, thou causes the rain to fall into the furrows. A furrow is a, a cut, if you will. The actual Hebrew word, check it out in the Strong's, means a cut, but it's like if you take a plow and you, with an animal or a tractor, you go across the, the, the ground and the ground is turned over from under up, and it, it creates a cut in the land and that's what's known as a furrow for those of you who aren't familiar with agricultural terms. But, and thou makest it soft, in other words, the rain, if, if ground, earth, doesn't receive rain, and particularly here in Arkansas, we got a lot of rocks, uh, but it's very hard ground. And the rain uh, causes it to where the farmers are able to prepare the earth even for planting. And I think the lesson for us is that without God, without his, the rain that he sends to soften the ground, we couldn't even put the, the seeds in the ground much less hope for a harvest unless we get his help in the rain. I think, you know, we, we talk about these agricultural terms and uh, I know from personal experience some of the most uh, religious people, uh, those who uh, know how important it is to have a good relationship with their heavenly fathers are those who work in agriculture because they know that their success depends very heavily on their heavenly father. If he doesn't send the rains, uh, there is no harvest, uh, there, there is no profit, there is no success. Verse 11, thou crownest the year with thy goodness and thy path drop fatness. In other words, they drip uh, fatness, looking forward uh, to the harvest. In other words, it's, it's a lot of work uh, farming and preparing the soil. Uh, tending it, making sure the weeds don't take it over. And then the actual uh, harvest itself is not a cakewalk. Uh, it's a lot of work. And then when that harvest is brought in, uh, you, you look at the history of, of any peoples on earth, there's usually a celebration after the harvest comes in to celebrate the abundant blessings that, that God has brought forth and also kind of an end, if you will, for that cycle of the year of the hard work. Verse 12, they drop upon the pastures of the wilderness and the little hills rejoice on every side, even the uncultivated areas. God takes care of those with the rains as well. Verse 13 to conclude Psalm 65, the pastures are clothed with flocks. The valleys also are covered over with corn. They, this being the people, shout for joy. They also sing. And a very, uh, as the harvest again comes in, it's a time of, of celebration, uh, not only for nature itself, but for man who inhabits, inhabits the, the earth. And it's written though, you know, I said that they being men here, 
but it's written in the New Testament that, that nature itself groans for the return of Messiah. And I, there's no doubt that nature itself, the hills, when Christ returns, will, will rejoice and, and leap for joy. And we always want to be careful when we're talking about food, too. I don't care if you're involved in agriculture or not involved in agriculture. When you sit down at the table, don't ever forget to thank God for the food that He's blessed you with. And if you don't think He provided that food, yeah, you may not be the one who was out there uh, preparing that soil to, to plant seeds in it or weeding it to keep make sure that they don't take it over or involved in the harvest. But I'll tell you what, if it weren't for those folks who are doing that, you wouldn't have any, and God, you wouldn't have any food to put on your table. So don't ever forget to thank him for that blessing of the food you're about to partake of. And you know, if you're in a, a public restaurant, uh, don't make a big show to be seen of men when you pray. But but in a restaurant, there's nothing wrong with you. You don't have to uh, close your eyes and get down on your knees, to, like I said, to be seen of men. But in, silently to yourself, uh, thank him for the blessing of that food you're about to receive and ask him to bless it to the good of your body. We have a subscription on Psalm 65 to the chief musician, to he who has the victory, to he who gives the victory, that of course is Messiah. Now we come to Psalm 66, um, which actually we could think of it as uh, praise promised, but also uh, we go back to the time of Moses when Israel was brought out of bondage to the Egyptians and there were times of trouble there. And then the times of trouble are going to be remembered in this psalm. It's a, a thanksgiving, if you will, for a national and personal deliverance, uh, uh, redemption, if you will. Now, the title, A Song or Psalm, uh, this is the first of a series of three. In other words, Psalm 66, 67, and 68 all have this same title, A Song or Psalm. 66 and 67 are anonymous. We're not given who the author is. 68, uh, David is the writer of it. Let's pick it up, Psalm 66, verse 1, and go with it. Make a joyful noise unto God, all ye lands, this being all the earth, all the inhabited earth, this means, and in other words, the peoples of the earth as well. Every time I think of a, make a joyful noise unto God, if, uh, when I'm at church and I enjoy singing, but I'm not very gifted in that department, and people who are standing around me while I'm uh, exercising my, or participating in the wonderful fellowship of singing along with the congregation, they know I can make a joyful noise singing, eh, not so much. Verse 2, sing forth the honor of his name, and his name is Yahweh. Make his praise glorious. Now in verses 1 through 12, the congregation speaks, the psalmist recording what the congregation is saying as a whole, but then, starting in verse 13 of this psalm, uh, the individual psalmist speaks. And we'll see that that individual uh, somewhat representative of the people. So this psalm very well could have been written by David as well. Verse 3, Say unto God, How terrible art thou in thy works! Through the greatness of thy power shall thine enemies submit themselves unto thee. Yare is this word terrible again. It should be translated uh, awesome or revered. It can, as I said earlier, mean fear as well. And rightfully, the enemies of God should fear him. And that's who's mentioned there in that last phrase. But they will everyone uh, from where the sun comes up in the east to where it goes down in the west will submit to the Lord. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. And I want you to make a note of Revelation chapter 15 
verses 3 and 4. And sometime within the next 24 hours, uh, do a comparison between verse 3 and 4 of this Psalm 66 and verses 3 and 4 uh, in the book of uh, chapter 15 in the book of Revelation. What's important about Revelation 15, 3 and 4? That's the song that those who overcome the Antichrist and don't worship him will be singing, the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. But the rest of that verse 3 and 4 in, in, in Revelation chapter 15 uh, smacks of Psalm 66 verses 3 and 4. Make a little com take a side study and make a little comparison of that. Verse 4, all the earth, not part of it, but all the earth shall worship thee and shall sing unto thee. They shall sing to thy name, Selah. The Selah here, stop, pause, meditate, uh, connecting the exhortation of the people in verses 1 through 4 uh, with verse 5 where we find the reason for that exhortation. What is the reason for it? Verse 5, come and see the works of God. He is terrible in his doing toward the children of men. Again, we have that word yare uh, translated terrible. Uh, should never have been that translated that way, or at least in English and modern English doesn't carry the meaning at all. It should be revered is God or awesome is God. Verse 6, he turned the sea into dry land. They went through the flood on foot. There did we rejoice in him. Now the first, I think the, he turned the sea into dry land uh, in Exodus chapter 14, verse 21, when God brought Israel out of the land of Egypt in bondage. The armies of Pharaoh were in hot pursuit. And, and what happened? Uh, Moses raised that staff over the, the Red Sea and it parted. And Israel walked across on dry land. And then what happened? Well, as the armies of Pharaoh got into the, the, the riverbed, the seabed, the seas came crashing back down, totally annihilating the armies of Pharaoh. I think the second Many people think both apply to the Red Sea. I think they went through the flood on foot. I think that phrase refers to uh, Joshua chapter 3 uh, all along about verse 17. You remember Joshua who replaced Moses in leading the children of Israel into the promised land. As, just as they were crossing the Jordan, the priests who were bearing the Ark of the Covenant as their feet set into the Jordan, and it was at flood stage. The Jordan was flooding at this time. What happened? That wall of God uh, stopped the waters from, and the people crossed over on dry land. Uh, what happened then? Well, God instructed Joshua to have one man from each tribe uh, take a stone from the bottom of the Jordan. And when they got to the other side, they built a memorial that when their children saw the stones, they'd say, what mean these 12 stones? And then they would tell, the parents would tell their children how God brought the, the people of Israel into the promised land. Verse 7, he ruleth by his power forever. He ruled by his power in the first earth and heaven age. He rules by his power in this, the second earth and heaven age. And guess what? He will rule by his power in the third and final earth and heaven age. His eyes behold the nations. Let not the rebellious exalt themselves. Selah, the rebellious exalt themselves. Let them not get egotistical. My mind went back to Psalm 64 Oh, what was it, verse 5 or 6 where they talk about uh, God doesn't see. Uh, let me see. Who shall, there we go, verse 5. They encourage themselves in an evil matter or word. 
they commune or count of laying snares privily. They say, who shall see them? And here in this verse, uh, verse 7, his eyes behold the nations. Our Heavenly Father doesn't miss anything. He sees everything. The Sila here uh, repeating the exhortation to praise and connecting the two halves of this psalm. Verse 8, O bless our God, ye people, and make the voice of his praise to be heard. And all of the people of the world, he is worthy of your praise. <clears throat> Verse 9, which holdeth, this word sum in the Hebrew, it means to put, if we read it that way, which he puts our soul in life and suffereth not our feet to be moved. And indeed, God knows every soul that he places in an embryo. Uh, you want proof of that documentation biblically? Uh, Jeremiah, the first chapter, along about verses 4, 5, and 6, uh, God speaking to Jeremiah says, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb and ordained you a prophet while you were still in your mother's womb. So, uh, and then you've got uh, Jacob, uh, whom God loved, and Esau, whom God hated. He knew those souls before he placed them in the embryo. And this suffereth not our feet to be moved doesn't allow us uh, to totter or to fall. And you know, if your feet are on the rock, Jesus Christ, uh, you won't be moved, you won't waver. Verse 10, for thou, O God, hast proved us. Thou hast tried us as silver is tried. This word proved means he's tested us. And yes, God's elect, he'll test you. He'll test others as well, but particularly he'll test the elect. You see, he doesn't want a bunch of hothouse lilies when we're delivered up before the Antichrist. So uh, he will test your, your okra, as we say here in Arkansas, ever once in a while. Thou hast tried us as silver is tried. If you take silver and you heat it up to the point that it becomes liquid, uh, then you can separate the silver from impurities that are found in the silver. It's called refining the silver. And yes, God will refine his children. He'll take the impurities out and make you more pure. How does he do that? Well, one way he does it is when he forgives your sin. Uh, those are impurities and he separates those out and they're gone and as a result, you're a better person for it. You're, you're refined, you're more pure, if you will. And I'm getting the, that's the end of our time for today, so that's probably a good a place to stop as any. Uh, when God tests you, uh, make sure that you don't uh, give in and waver. Know that he's always there for you, and you can call on him. The lesson of Psalms, you can take refuge in him. So. When the going gets tough, and it's going to get tough, believe me, uh, don't forget your Heavenly Father is there to help you through it. He'll refine you. He'll make you pure uh, to where you can stand against the fiery darts of Satan. If you follow his instructions, love and serve him. We've got a short message. We'll ask you to listen a moment, won't you please? The Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible is an invaluable tool to the serious Bible student. The Strong's Concordance lists every word used in the Bible and every passage where the word utilized may be found in the scriptures. With the assistance of a reference numbering system, the English reader may easily translate any word back to the original Hebrew, Chaldee, or Greek in which God's word was written. The Companion Bible is a unique study Bible. In addition to the text of the King James Version Bible, an extra wide margin contains a wealth of information not found in other Bibles. A system of structures or outlines employed by the Companion Bible will allow the readers to rightly divide the Bible. The use of these structures help the reader follow the subject matter and therefore they are critical to an understanding of God's Word. The 198 appendixes found in the Bible cover a wide variety of topics and information which will enlighten your studies. 
The Companion Bible and Strongest Concordance are a must for the serious Bible student. Welcome back. We're glad you could join back with us. Let's have the 800 number, please. 800-643-4645. That number good throughout Puerto Rico, the U.S. and Canada. I mean, you can make that call and it won't, you won't have a toll on it. Uh, if you have a biblical question that you'd like to uh, pose to be answered on the air, feel free to call that number and leave your question. Don't ask questions about a specific individual denomination or organization by name. We teach God's Word in a, a positive format. Throwing out negative about others by name serves no purpose. We simply won't do it. We, we teach God's Word, let the chips fall where they do. His Word can uh, teach, correct, and heal. If you're listening by shortwave radio around the world or studying via internet somewhere around the world that can't use that 800 number toll free, uh, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Quite all right to mail your questions in as well. Got a prayer request? Don't need a telephone number. You don't need a mailing address. Go to your Heavenly Father. He's there for you 24-7. Uh, he, he's anxious to hear from you especially if you love and serve him, he wants to reward you. And, you know, he, need, he knows your every need, but he still wants you to, to tell him that you love him if you mean it. Don't think you can con God, uh, but he, you're his child and you should develop that relationship where you can talk with him just as you would talk with your earthly father. We do have these prayer requests, Father. We come united as one in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask you to look upon these, Father. You know their needs, illnesses uh, in family, recovering from surgery, Father. You know their needs. Uh, if it is your will, a special blessing on each of these. We also lift up our military troops who are in harm's way around the world, Father. Watch over, guide, direct, touch, heal, in Yeshua, Jesus' precious name. Amen and thank you, Father. Let's get to some questions. See what's on the mind of folks. Veronica in New York. <clears throat> Pastor Dennis, I need your discernment. I study God's Word uh, in the morning as soon as I wake. I read the Bible at lunch. I listen to the broadcast in the afternoon. I also sometimes study at nighttime before bed. I even listen to the chapel CDs while I do stuff around the house and sometimes outside the house. I have for over a year almost completely stayed out of the world via TV, movies, internet, etc. My question is, if I set an hour or so at the end of the day after all studying and work is done and maybe play a video game, is that taking part in the world? I feel strongly not to do so because in the past I have not been disciplined enough to only play a set amount of time, even though I do feel disciplined enough now. Also, I feel as if I am turning my back on our Heavenly Father and almost like a slap in His face, as if to say the Word is not enough for me, your advice, please. Okay, well, Veronica, different people have different appetites for study. And, you know, you need other interests as well. Uh, it's important that, that, that you have some uh, source of entertainment in your life. And if you find video games entertaining, you know, and they're not uh, super violent uh, or of, of, uh, of an unclean, let's call it, nature, there's nothing wrong with playing video games. But, you know, I think all too often younger people today uh, get all too absorbed in video games. They, they, especially some of these that are so violent, I can't help but believe that's uh, some of the reasons that we have problems of violence in our schools is if, you know, I mean, if you, if you give your kid a game, your child, I should call them, a game, and he's sitting there shooting people all day and then uh, he goes to school and he gives people a hard time or is violent with them, uh, why should we be surprised, you know? So kind of parents, you are responsible for monitoring what your kids do 
with the internet and with video games. And I'll tell you, they can get in a bunch of trouble in a hurry if you don't monitor them on the internet. I'm talking about uh, sexual prow uh, uh, predators, et cetera, on the internet. You better have a handle on what your kids are doing on the internet or they could end up in a, in a lot of trouble and in a lot of danger, better said. But, you know, if you're an adult and you enjoy playing video games, uh, you know, pray about it. Ask God, you know, to give you strength to, to control your appetite for uh, the video games. And you, you suspected you had a problem before, you might still have it. But uh, be disciplined in everything. You know, most things in life, if you do them in moderation, you're not going to run into any trouble or problems with it. But it's when we get excessive with things, such as drinking, uh, alcohol, for example. If, if that's all you do from morning to night uh, is drink alcohol, you got a problem and you need to get help for it. But, and you're not going to get much else accomplished in life while you're in that condition. John in Pennsylvania. Will you please explain the law of the burnt offering, meat offering, sin offering, trespass offering, consecrations, and sacrifice of the peace offerings? That would take like about the book of Leviticus to explain all of those uh, in depth, and I just don't have time to do it, John. Know this, none of those applies today. Is it interesting to study? You bet, the law is our schoolmaster which brings us unto Jesus Christ. But once Christ paid the price on the cross, all of these sacrifices and offerings um, were ordinances that became uh, of non-effect uh, because the blood of Christ on the cross covers our sins and, and all of the sacrifices. God doesn't want our sacri animal sacrifices, our burnt offerings anymore. Hosea 6.6, 6, he wants your mercy, which should have been translated your love. And rather than burnt animals, he would rather you have you be knowledgeable in his word. <clears throat> Hosea 6.6. 6. Barbara in Oklahoma, uh, I am saving five months of canned food. I also have suggestion if this is okay. I guess she's asking if this is okay. Can I prepay electric on my house for five months? Also prepay city trash and water. Then I do not need money for those utilities for the five month period when the Antichrist is here. Is that okay? And of course that's okay. Be wiser uh, than the serpent. Cheryl in Missouri. <clears throat> I'm still trying to get things straight in my mind, but I'm confused regarding the following. Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 and 5. The souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, uh, and I'll add to that those who don't worship the Antichrist, reigned with Christ 1,000 years. And then verse 5, but the rest of the dead lived not again until 1,000 years were finished. Who are these dead? They're those who did not take part in the first resurrection. In other words, not God's elect. In other words, they worshiped the Antichrist. They didn't know any better. They didn't take time to study God's word. They weren't taught that the Antichrist comes first and Christ comes after that. When they, we say they're dead, live not again for the thousand years, it means that they are spiritually dead. Uh, they have a, a spiritual body, but their soul is mortal. Mortal means liable to die. And certainly when the white throne judgment occurs, some of those souls uh, will go into the lake of fire and perish. However, those who partake of the first resurrection, the power of the, the second death has no power over them as it's written there in Revelation chapter 20, verses 5 and 6. In other words, they are in the eternity. Uh, the white throne judgment uh, cannot cause them to go into the lake of fire. <clears throat> Mark in Oklahoma, who will be the teachers 
And who will be the students in the millennium? Well, the overcomers that we were just talking about, those who don't worship the Antichrist, will reign with Christ a thousand years. That, that means they will be uh, teaching, instructing others. And of course, those that uh, will be being taught are those who didn't, never had a chance to hear truth uh, before Christ returned at the seventh trump, the beginning of the Lord's day. Janelle in Mississippi, uh, are we to live according to the New Covenant verses or the old law? Well, there is a difference between law, statutes, and ordinances. And it's important that you understand that uh, because if you try, if we just talked about the, the sacrifices a minute ago, those are called blood ordinances. And most of those were nailed to the cross with Christ. They don't apply anymore. Uh, so when you talk about New Testament, Old Testament, whether we're to uh, live accordingly, uh, you can't throw it all into one ball of wax. Uh, the, the law is still very much in effect. What does the law tell us? Well, the law says, thou shalt not kill. Better translated, thou shalt not do any premeditated murder. It tells us, thou shalt not steal. Do you think we should steal today? Of course not. The law still applies. The ordinances, on the other hand, uh, nailed to the cross, the blood ordinances in particular, nailed to the cross with Christ. Pastor Arnold Murray has a two uh, CD or two cassette tape set called The Law, and he goes into that biblically as far as distinguishing the difference between law, statutes, and ordinances. Darian in Missouri, the Bible speaks of a resting place. Do we go there when we die or heaven? Well, when we die, uh, we go to paradise. The, the, the resting place, if you abide, which is a Greek word in the New Testament, uh, mone with Christ, you can go there now. You don't have to wait until you die. You, you can dwell if you will, or continue as another word, Monet is translated, or abide with Christ today. If he's in you and you in him, you are living together, you're dwelling together. In the Psalms, over and over and over, we learn that God is my refuge. And in John, the book of St. John, chapter 14, where Jesus says, you know, in my Father's house are many mansions. Uh, I go there to prepare a place for you. And that word mansions is that same Greek word I was telling you about a minute ago, mone, and it means to abide with Christ. And again, you don't have to wait till you die to go there. You can go there right now uh, if Christ is in you and you in him. Robert in California, the scientists say the sun will go supernova what does the Bible say about that? Well, the Bible tells us in Revelation uh, chapter 21, we have New Jerusalem described there in verse 23. And it states there, And the city had no need of the sun, neither moon, to shine. For the glory of the Lord did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. So if the sun goes supernova, at that point, doesn't matter because the Lord is uh, the glory. The, the glory of the Lord is the light of the new city, Jerusalem, and the Lamb, the light thereof. Uh, and you follow that, Robert, with a second question. I am disabled. How can I do something for the Lord? Well, you can uh, give a smile to someone who needs a smile or a word of encouragement to someone who needs a word of encouragement. Visit the elderly and or the sick is something that you can do. You can also, Robert, witness for the Lord. And you know, that's a powerful witness when, when someone sees someone who is disabled and they're still able to express their faith in Jesus Christ and how wonderful having a relationship with the Lord is. They think to themselves, how could this person be in this situation and still have such a positive outlook on life? 
I think I'm missing something here, they have to think. So you can be a very powerful witness. Viola, and I don't know where Viola's from, how does God know which soul to put into each body? Well, because he knows everything, and Father is omniscient, which means he has uh, infinite awareness and complete knowledge. But the fact that he does know which soul goes into which body is uh, very easy to prove, as we mentioned it already. I think Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 1 through 6, he said to Jeremiah, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb, in her belly. Terry in California, when we get down to the five-month period, we were wondering if we bought grocery store credit cards that don't expire ahead of time, would this be okay? Of course, be wiser than the serpent. It was kind of like the, uh, the suggestion we had earlier about prepaying your electric and, and your other utilities. One thing that I would be concerned about in prepaying groceries, though, would be that it, they most likely, if it's a prepaid card, when Antichrist is here, he's going to want you to uh, exchange your prepaid card for an Antichrist approved card, and all you have to do to obtain one of those is worship me, the Antichrist speaking. That's the key. Don't worship the Antichrist. We can survive. We will survive. If you're one of God's elect, he's going to help you survive because you're working to accomplish his plan. But uh, uh, prepaying is probably a good idea on a, a food card such as that, but still a good idea, I think, to have uh, some precious metals on hand because why they've always been valuable, they always will be valuable. You can trade a piece of silver for a bag of groceries uh, if times, when times get tough. Also, good idea to have, you know, some canned goods stocked up and supplied. You could have a truck strike in your city, and do you know how long it would take for the grocery shelves to be bare if, if nothing was coming in on the trucks? Wouldn't take long, so best to have some, uh, uh, some survivalist uh, knowledge about yourself and, and be prepared. Be sure and keep those perishable foodstuffs uh, rotated and, and don't use them after uh, you're past the use dates. Uh, Lila in, in Colorado, uh, are you affiliated with any other church? No, we are non-denominational Christian. Uh, we do not have any affiliates and uh, we're independent, if you will. Uh, the, probably the largest independent church in, in the United States, maybe perhaps in the world. Robert in Tennessee, I don't think I'm one of God's elect, but is there any help for me? Well, of course, God's elect are relatively few in number, and, and to say that only God's elect uh, have salvation would not be correct. Uh, a far greater number of people will have salvation than uh, those who are God's election. Augustino in California, I am 90 years old and your program has helped me immensely. Well, God bless you, 90 years, that's quite an accomplishment. My question is, if Lucifer is in hell, I mean he is not in hell, he is in heaven in chains held by Michael, where is hell located? Is it on the other side of the gulf? Is, if there is a hell, why isn't Lucifer in it instead of in heaven guarded by Michael? I'd appreciate your help. God bless. Okay, well, God bless you, Augustino. And, and hell uh, is not in existence at this point in time. Hell is the lake of fire that you find and read about at the end of Revelation chapter 20. Uh, Lucifer, as you call him, that's one of his names in Isaiah chapter 14. That's his name there, Lucifer, but he has many other names. The dragon, the serpent, the devil, Satan, all will go into the lake of fire as it's written in Revelation chapter 20. And that's what hell is, but it's not going to be an ongoing uh, event, if you will. Once they're consumed, we move into the eternity, 
And by consumed, I mean God is a consuming fire. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29. Once all evil and wicked has been consumed, then we move into the eternity. The earth is rejuvenated. There are no more tears. There is no more uh, sorrow, no sickness, no death, as it's written <coughs> Excuse me, in Revelation chapter 21, the first five verses. Barbara in New York. I know this sounds like a dumb question, but I have been puzzled by the description of the devil, excuse me, the devil for some time. How did it come about that Satan is described as a red creature with horns, a tail, hooved feet, and carrying a pitchfork? I know Satan is probably not some ugly creature, but can be uh, a handsome being or dragon or serpent. He, he was handsome enough to beguile Mother Eve and whatever he makes himself to be so he can lead us astray. Also, a lot of people usually say we go up to heaven and meet St. Peter at the gate or go down to hell in the fire and greeted by this ugly red creature when we die. Uh, I now know we return to the Father and our soul is on one side or the other of the gulf till the great judgment day. I just wondered about all this and, and down business got started, how this up and down, uh, up and down heaven or hell business got started. Ezekiel 28, 12, Satan, he's called the king of Tyre there, created the full pattern, full of wisdom and beauty. He is a good looking rascal. I think I'll come back to your question as we begin our next lecture, but I am out of time. I love you all because you enjoy studying our word, his Father's Word in depth. He loves you because you do. You know we're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you. Won't you do that and reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness? Most, one thing most important, beloved, it's this. You stay in His Word every day. Every day in His Word is a good day. Do you know why? Because Jesus is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.